One of the most common questions I ask is, if, as we grow the electric vehicle fleet, and soon we have, instead of thousands, we have hundreds of thousands and then eventually millions, how will the electrical grid handle all that extra load? My usual response is that utilities are already planning for that. There's plenty of smart people in the utility, in the regulators, and in private sector companies that are addressing this issue. One of them is a company called Sparkion. It's an American company. And I'm going to be talking to Cole Rawson, who is the Director of Business Development. So welcome to the interview, Cole. Great. Thanks so much for having us today. So now we'll get to your... Uh, what your company does in a moment, but I want to address that general issue uh, of how the grid will handle the extra load from all of those EVs. And given that your company uh, has an AI management, energy management system that helps with that, what's your take on that question that I get asked all the time? Yeah, sure. So you know, it's, it's a question I get asked all the time as well. And people always get confused sometimes about generation versus actually distribution or transmission. And the truth is, you know, we have a lot of generation capabilities globally, so we can produce plenty of energy when it's needed. But how do we produce energy at the exact right time and then transmit that vast amount of energy to the actual site host or end user that needs it? And that's really where that bottleneck comes into play. Right. If we think about it, you've got this this funnel style uh, organization of our utility grid that starts these huge power plants, then steps down and transformers, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to the very end of the stream to say these big DC fast chargers now that are opening up that funnel all the way at the bottom of the stream. So the real question is, how do we really deliver vast amounts of energy at the smallest part of the funnel? And that's where the the main challenge comes into play here, which is really the problem that we aim to solve. Okay, it seems like there's two facets to this. One is uh, charging stations. Uh, so at your service station or wherever they might be. So they're the fat kind of fast chargers. But then we've got a lot of charging. I think I've seen you know, 80, 85% of charging gets done at home, uh, at home or work. So what I hear the most is that the easiest way to solve this problem is to shift EV charging from say, uh, let's say it's being done between five and 10 or 11 p.m. at night and shift it from 11 p.m. to five or six in the morning when the load is the lightest. Is that a big part of the solution? Yeah, that that's absolutely a solution. You know, I, I think that in, in a way we've actually, and we have say the utility companies and, and scientists and engineers, um, they've sort of solved a big part of the sustainability crisis, which is, as long as we can develop uh, clean renewable energy, if we can distribute it efficiently, this is the whole puzzle. And, and the answer there is communications channels. So to your point, if we can somehow know in every neighborhood, in every garage, precisely when a car is coming and going, um, what that charging pattern looks like, and then look at that at a very large scale of that entire neighborhood, you can all of a sudden, to your point, load shift and actually use the specific load at a specific house at a specific time and optimally charge that vehicle. So the game plan here would be distributing that load across a longer period of time for whatever it's needed. And, and the way that we would call that is basically flattening the load profile, flattening the curve. And you know what utility companies look for, sustainables look for, is basically how do we create a flat, predictable load curve? And at the end of the day, this entire equation is about data. And again, you know, whether it's residential charging that you said about 85% is going to happen at home, absolutely. I think we're seeing a larger capacity happen at DC fast charging sites right now, but this is just a consumer mentality shift, you know, getting away from fuel stations into this other way that they, they live their life with their car. Um, but it's, it all just comes down to data, data and predictability. Okay, so let's say that you have the, the data. Uh, you, the utility or whoever's doing this uh, has the data uh, and you have, but what about the means to shift the load? Because unless, as I understand this, unless you have the demand management response capability in, in each garage or with attached to each electric vehicle, that's what you need to make optimal use of that, of the, of the data and the analytics that go along with it. Am I correct on, on that? 
Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. So it all comes down to ensuring that every charger, whether it's a public commercial charger, whether it's in your personal garage, it has to be networked in some way, shape, or form. So it's usually got some kind of Wi-Fi connection or cellular connection, which is then integrated into a um, you know a charging network essentially, and that charging network can speak wirelessly to the utility grid, understand what that actually that load looks like, and then shift it to your point based on when there's excess load that's available on the grid, when it makes most sense. But again, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of different data points. And then you're overlaying that on say 15 minute meter interval reading of that specific site that then aggregates into a much larger um, area. So again, you're, you're talking about huge, vast amounts of data and ensuring that you can create trends of all those different data patterns and then understand precisely based on what kind of charger it is, how much energy it's using, even going downstream and looking at the telematics of that specific vehicle. Because keep in mind, every EV is a different charging pattern, right? A, a different battery load profile and how it charges based on its state of charge. And you've got to think about every touch point at that, at that case. Now, um, last year I interviewed uh, a woman whose company in Los Angeles created, uh, they, they ran virtual power plants. And part, not only did they aggregate the uh, solar capability, the, the solar generation from rooftops within their, their catchment area in their neighborhood, but they, they also included storage. But what I thought was really cool about it is that they could control they had they could control the heat or cooling in each individual unit of the apartments that were part of the virtual power plant right down to the degree you know they could lower it four degrees or six degrees or raise it whatever they to meet the load uh, to, you know uh, to meet the the uh, uh, demand to manage the man demand response i guess is the best way to put it is that what we might be looking at in a neighborhood level, like in you know, like in your your typical suburban neighborhood, where a virtual power plant company comes in and and manages all of that, uh, you know, basically for it, it's between the utility and the consumers. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the dream in a way, but uh, I would you know pose the question to to the United States or Canada or the world. Um, how much is that a utopian thought process versus people being willing to actually give up that individual control or, or, or put that trust, if you will, into the utility company there? So I think, look, that's definitely a future. It's very likely going to happen. It's a necessity that we do something like that. When you talk about demand response that you just mentioned, you know, the whole premise is that you do have solar. When the solar maybe is not used because electricity is just in time, it's getting stored in a battery. And then when the utility grid needs to pull for demand response, maybe it's curtailing a load on a specific site and then backfilling that load with the battery or pulling directly from the battery. So it can maybe even omit having to have a demand response protocol anyway, right? We always have some kind of surplus energy, assuming that we have enough energy generation and enough storage and enough uh, kind of small communications patterns that I mentioned before, whether it's residential, commercial, um, this really can bring this, this entire holistic picture together. And if we do have these networked devices, you mentioned kind of a smart heater or air conditioning. We've worked with a, a commercial client before who installed uh, smart air conditioning. So that, to your point, we can actually leverage software to individually shift each individual air conditioning based on different parts of the store, based on different times of the day. And then that's also attached to their EV charging. So that load can shift when EVs are plugged in to the utility with open ADR for demand response. So again, once we bring the entire picture together, um, we have this answer, but it's just an enormous piece of infrastructure to actually implement. Now, your company, as I understand it, is an AI-driven management system. Uh, are you working at the residential level or at the commercial level, maybe at the you know electric chargers? Yep. Uh, what, sure. What's your so, what's your business model? Yeah, fair, fair. So we are focused primarily on the CNI industry, so on the commercial side of the business. And the thought process is that the the most immediate need is to support DC fast charging infrastructure. Because I mean, if we think about it, 150 kilowatt charger is using more energy in a 15 minute period, probably than the whole neighborhood is using in their overnight you know, level two charging in that case. So 
you know, the premise is that these DC fast chargers show a lot of volatility in that load profile I mentioned before, which is doing the exact opposite of our goal of flattening that load profile and flattening that curve. So the premise of Sparkion is that, yes, we have battery storage hardware, and this is relatively agnostic, right? These are lithium ion batteries or inverters or cabinets, but it's really the software that makes the hardware intelligent. And you've got to have this AI piece in because like I mentioned before, the ultimate way that, that we can achieve reducing greenhouse gases, reducing how um, peak power plants are used, right? These dirty diesel generators um, is by understanding and precisely predicting how much load is going to be used at a specific site at a specific time of the day. And the biggest challenge we face is let's say it's a gas station that's just installed EV charging. That's great. It's a corridor. It's supporting the transition. But there's a lot of volatility and unpredictability to fuel station. So ideally, as we get more and more data usage of that specific fuel site, you can create regression models and correlations that show when specific charting patterns are going to happen and how many kilowatt hours they're going to be using at a specific amount of time. And that's where this AI comes into play, because then we have to overlay, say, if there's solar on site, is it a sunny day out? Statistically, on February 1st, is it going to be sunny? in this specific area, um, perhaps is it peak and off-peak energy usage? So there's so many different factors that come into play that the computer model has to really start considering. And again, the ultimate goal of all of these inputs is to develop that predictable outcome for say the next 15 minutes or maybe the next day and ensure at all times enough energy is stored in the battery or upstream that we know the utility has to produce X amount of energy Maybe they can produce a certain percentage of that from sustainables, hopefully, or maybe they're pulling that from the grid. Uh, Cole, how close are we to getting to where we need to be? Are we two years away, five years away, 10 years away? Give us a, just an approximate take on this. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm, I, I try to be an, an idealist more than a realist as we have to be right in this um, this transition uh, to this kind of new model. You know, I think a big part of this then comes into the question of vehicle to grid charging, right? We've, you know, um, bi-directional charging. It's all about creating that balance. You know, I think the short answer to your question is it's like, when is autonomous driving gonna be at level, you know, five autonomy? Um, this is probably 15 years away 12, 15 years away, I'd say. Um, so when we talk about energy transition, again, I, I would say it's kind of on par with that. So it's how much are we starting to let computers really take over for our e-mobility, our energy flow? Um, this is tons and tons of infrastructure updates that we're talking about. So I'd say on the, the low end, 10 years, 15 years, something like that. But um, you know, the, the challenge with all of this is that it's site by site, it's segmented, it's fragmented. You've got different laws and legislation, state by state, city by city, town by town. So it's really, it's it's up to individuals more than anything to, to drive change. Well, let me run a hypothesis past you because in, in the work that I do around uh, energy transitions, uh, I argue that the 2020s are really the, the disruptive decade of this, this transition. This is when all of these new technologies uh, become commercial, and they're being, you know, pushing the old technologies out of the marketplace. And it's and it's usually, you know, ten or fifteen years of intense disruption. So I would, I'm going to hypothesize here and say, the rest of this decade is going to be chaotic, maybe even a little bit longer. But by the by the end of 2030 ish, somewhere around there, a lot of the innovation and and disruption will have been done, will have figured out the technology, will have figured out the regulatory regime, will have figured out, you know, how the utilities role and all of that stuff. And the 2030s will be about making it work, making it work better, uh, doing it at broader scale than we have to date. And by 2040, uh, the kind of situation we're talking about, which is really only 17 years away, which in the, you know, in, in the, you, in the uh, electricity system is blink of an eye. Does that sound like a reasonable hypothesis? I think so. I think it's a, a very solid point. Um, I think that uh, say the last five years or so, people have just been learning what EV charging is, battery storage and behind the meter battery storage, right? Whereas what we focus on, what we've been talking about today, 
this is not even in the discussion yet. So I think actually this decade alone or the next five to six years are really going to be focused on uh, battery energy storage and what we're really doing with load balancing at individual chargers, leveraging that data that I mentioned. And, you know, at the end of the day, data is only as good as how much data you put in and what kind of data you put in. So statistically, the more time that goes on, the better our data gets and the more refined we can come with those solutions. So I think just to get to that organized chaos, if you will, we need time. This is this is the biggest thing we need, which some could argue we don't have that much time, but uh, I think in the scheme of things, 17 years sounds about right, and, and that seems pretty plausible. Now, I'm hearing, uh, uh, starting to hear uh, from American entrepreneurs in this in similar spaces, in the tech, climate tech space, about the effects of the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. It's beginning to filter in, and it's being a, like uh, uh, on the battery management side, on the battery side. You know, it's it's already having an, an effect in terms of orders and and people are ramping up and scaling up. Uh, in in the, the space that we're talking about, what effect do you think the U.S. Uh, IRA will will have? Enormous, absolutely enormous, both on a utility scale standpoint, on a behind the meter standpoint. When I say utility scale, so it's front of the meter. Uh, you know, in the space that we play, in the commercial standpoint, of for EV charging, that's behind the meter. It's about 30% of an immediate reduction in tax credits that comes there. And that's the difference between making it a, a net profit for that site host versus making a net negative CapEx investment over a certain period of time. So it, it's a huge deal. You know, I would argue you've got to be closer to about 50% of that discount. So there's other incentives that states have that utilities are coming to the table with. Um, but it's, it's, it's an enormous, enormous uh, change. The European Union's actually just announced yesterday, I believe, that they're going to be uh, rolling out a structure that's very similar to the Inflation Reduction Act to support tax credits and rolling out infrastructure like this. Um, I think the biggest challenge that we face with all of this is that uh, battery storage is based on really the commodity price of lithium. Uh, and, and stationary battery storage is purchasing lithium at a much smaller volume than, say, EV manufacturers. So whereas EV manufacturers are getting this volumized discount, stationary storage is still at a different level than, say, EVs. So there's not really a price parity there between the two, which is sometimes a challenge. But the Inflation Reduction Act is really supporting, uh, helping drive that a bit lower. I interviewed uh, the CEO of a battery company last uh, last fall, uh, and they make zinc ion stationary batteries. They're just coming to the market now. Uh, they argue that their while their product is heavy, it's not suited to EVs, but it is suited to you know to being in your garage or it's be, you know sited on your industrial property or maybe at utility scale. But it's it's has the same performance characteristics as lithium ion, but it's thirty percent lower cost. And then now we're hearing about iron, lithium iron, and we're you know all kinds of other chemistries, flow batteries. Is that the future of stationary storage? And 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 will that accelerate the process we just have been talking about? Yeah. So zinc ion, um, I think there's a really good use case for that on utility storage and. Um, basically, the, the reason that most behind the meter stationary storage focus on lithium ion is that it's very high energy density, so it can react very quickly, and that's the reason it's in electric vehicles as well. Um, I think things like solid state and, and other compounds are still quite a long time away. Um, the biggest thing that we're actually investing in is second life batteries, and this opens an entirely other conversation up. But if you think about a circular, a circular economy and how many batteries are starting to come out of vehicles even already that have 70, 80 percent life left, um, we're really investing heavily right now to technology that focuses on how do we harness second life batteries and double the lifespan of them all of a sudden. So rather than invest in zinc ion or solid state, whatever, let's use all the raw materials that's already been harnessed and let's maximize the lifespan out of them. And I think for us, that brings us for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years at that point, before we even start looking at another uh, fossil fuel of sorts. Great. Well, Cole, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. Appreciate the time.